Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our presentation on the 2022 Habitat Projects at Lower Sailor Bar in Nimbus Basin. My name is Jessica Law, and I'm the Executive Director of the Sacramento Water Forum. I'm really excited to be here this evening, and I'm thrilled that you've joined us to learn more about the history of the Water Forum, the history of these projects, and why we're working in the river this year, why it's so important, and then what to expect as a neighbor and a resident and a supporter of Habitat. So just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, so this webinar is being recorded. It will be up on our website after the meeting uh, so that you can rewatch it or send it around. Uh, we are also doing a live transcript, and that is available if you click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please feel free to submit questions as we go through the, through the presentation. All you need to do is use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. So um, just share your name and your location or organization when you do that. And then also, we will answer questions at the end as time allows. So let me just do a brief overview of the presentation this evening. We're going to talk a bit about background for uh, on fish and adromous fish in our habitat program. Um, and again, why we're doing this work. We're going to talk about the two projects at Lower Sailor Bar and at Nimbus Basin. And then we're going to talk about public outreach and really what to expect um, as these projects progress. And then we'll have some time for questions and next steps. Okay. Just a little bit about the Water Forum. So the Water Forum has been around for about 20 years. Uh, we are an organization uh, that includes stakeholders from environmental, business, water, uh, and the civic and public groups. Uh, and we're really focused on two things. We're focused on protecting the water supply for the region um, and ensuring that there is economic growth and that growth is supported. Uh, and then we are also very focused on preserving the fishery, wildlife, recreation, and aesthetic values of the Lower American River. These are not just our objectives or our mission, but it is our day-to-day -day work that we do. And we are very engaged in all of these uh, and all the aspects of this work, uh, both on the technical, the scientific, and of course, on policy, and then also implementation projects, which you're going to hear more about tonight. Okay. So I am going to um, switch it. Oh, no, actually, let me just I'll stay here for a second. Let me just tell you a little bit about the projects that we do. We have 10 sites that we work in along the stretch of the Lower American River. Uh, it's about the 10 miles that go from Nimbus Dam uh, down a little bit south. You can see on the map here, we've got areas um, identified where we do our work. Uh, so we're going to be talking about two of these projects this evening. And I have to say that, you know, while you're going to hear from me and Erica Bishop, who is our program manager, um, we there are so many people that are involved in these projects and really are working behind the scenes to make sure that they happen. So uh, we do not do this work alone and we cannot do this work alone. Uh, we work with state and federal agencies and local agencies um, and the members of the Water Forum. Um, so the federal agencies that we work with are the Bureau of Reclamation. They are a major project funder. Uh, we also work with uh, the California Natural Resources Agency, who is a project funder and supporter. Um, and then the American River Parkway is owned and managed by Sacramento County Regional Parks, and we work very closely with them as well. Um, the fisheries agencies like the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and also U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are integral project partners, as well as SAFCA, who supports us on the permitting side. Um, and uh, my favorite part of these projects is that they are uh, constructed uh, mainly by City of Sacramento Department of Utilities crews. You can see their picture up there. And we've been working with them and many of these project partners for over a decade now. Uh, and it's such a good, such a good pro part, project partnership. And um, I'm excited to tell you more about it. Okay. Just a little bit more about funding. Uh, our main funding comes from two sources, both federal and state. This is the first year that we're going to be using uh, state funding from Prop 68, uh, which was voted in by the California voters. Um, and we are implementing, um, you know, about 80% of this project is being implemented 
uh, by Prop 68 funds, uh, and that's you know to protect and restore habitat, not just in Lower American River, but really there's projects throughout the state. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that, but it's nice to have this funding share from both state and federal sources. Okay, well with that, let me switch it over to Erica and she can tell you all about why we do these projects and why they're important. Thank you, Jessica. Um, as Jessica mentioned, I'm Erica Bishop. For those of you who have not met me in person, I am our Habitat and Science Program Manager at the Water Forum. I came on uh, this time last year and it's been, what a year it's been. So <clears throat> I'm excited to share more with you about why we do these projects in the river. Um, although the Lower American is home to over 40 species of fish, we really target two species of salmonids with our projects. Uh, those are our steelhead trout, which are federally listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, and our fall run Chinook salmon, which although they are the most abundant run in the Central Valley, they are considered a species of concern or special concern by National Marine Fisheries Service and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, these two species use our river for uh, a huge portion of their life cycle, including spawning and rearing. And uh, anadromous salmonids have been in the, they've been migrating to and from their natal streams for millions of years. Actually, the Pacific salmon, uh, they've, they've been documented um, that they've been around for between five and six million years. So uh, much longer than any, any human influence has been on the earth. So the reason why we need the, the restoration projects for uh, our multiple life stages of our salmonids are, um, so that we can support them and uh, through our huge changes that we've had in our watersheds. Um, a little bit about salmonids for those of you who don't know, many of you hear every fall that we're having spawning, spawning in the river, spawning is happening. So in the fall, our fall run Chinook salmon come in and um, back to the river that they were born in. This is after they've been in the ocean around two to four years on average, but some of them come back after one year and some of them take a little bit longer. Uh, those adults come back to the river they find places where they um, where it looks good. The female actually uh, creates a nest, which is called a red, and she uses her tail. And it's actually fascinating to see if you can ever see some underwater video um, to actually clean the gravel um, in in spawning areas. And she sweeps her tail around and actually creates somewhat of a vacuum to clean that gravel of um, you know fine sediment and moss and algae and fluff it up. So you'll hear us talk about fluffy gravel a lot in our projects. She fluffs up that gravel and creates a place to lay her eggs. Those are fertilized and then that is um, that area is covered over by uh, additional clean gravel. After uh, a couple of months, th those eggs, they, they incubate in this gravel. After a few months um, of living off of the yolk sac that they're born with, the, the eggs emerge as fry. They will spend several months in the river before going through a process called smultification, where they, um, in a nutshell, uh, undergo the physical changes they need to in order to live in salt water eventually. Um, eventually, they migrate out to sea, they spend their few years out there, and then come back to complete their life cycle the same way that their parents did. Our steelhead follow a similar life cycle, although on a slightly different time frame. Um, they come back later in the year, and a small percentage of our steelhead actually do not die after spawning. They may uh, live to spawn again, and they may stay over in the in the river for a year before they head out to the ocean. Um, the in order to complete these portions of their life cycle, our salmonids need the right water temperature, and they need the correct flows. They need the right size gravel to spawn, and that's between a half an inch up to about three inch for steelhead, and about four inch for our chinook salmon. And they also need rearing areas after those eggs have hatched and those very, very small juvenile fish, they need places to, to hide from predators and find food and cover. And um, one reason why we need, or a major reason why we need these projects is that, um, you know, over time we have seen declining habitat all over the state, um, particularly in the Central Valley. As soon as Europeans came in and started modifying uh, our watersheds to divert water between streams and watersheds, um, that affected our flows. And then uh, what many of you know as a huge stressor has been the effects of hydraulic mining over 150 years ago, which we still see the effects from today, which drastically um, affected spawning habitat. They filled in streams. It caused a tremendous amount of erosion that eventually moved its way downstream and caused flooding in the valley. But that's really a different presentation. 
Um, the dams that came later, um, Jurassic Hill reduced habitat by blocking fish passage, both upstream and downstream. So it limited our fish to, uh, you know, mostly the valley floor and a few foothill areas. And the dams that we, we all rely on for our water supply, our flood control, and our hydropower, you know, we, we need all of these things as humans, but they dramatically altered the hydrology um, from what would have occurred during, um, you know, natural conditions. When we had big rain, winter rainstorms and, and snow that would have melted off in the spring and early summer, um, that water is now stored behind Folsom Dam uh, for us to use later on for water supply and irrigation. Our dams also block sediment transport. So a natural stream would have ongoing erosion in the upper watershed and the bed and banks that would come down and help replenish areas for fish to spawn. But um, that is uh, greatly reduced. So the quality and the function of our habitat that the fish have in the Lower American is, um, is much compromised. And that is illustrated here on this map that you see. Uh, the red area illustrates um, the over 200 miles of historical main stem and tributary habitat that our fish had, uh, various uh, salmon and steelhead runs had to um, use in the lower and upper watershed. With the advent of Folsom and Nimbus dams, that over 200 miles has been reduced to about 23 miles between the confluence or Nimbus Dam and the confluence with the Sacramento River. And of those 23 miles, the upper 10 miles are really where our projects are focused because those areas have the best temperature and hydraulic conditions for um, habitat. And <clears throat> as Jessica mentioned, um, this is our 10th habitat project. Um, these are funded through CVPIA and Water Forum member contributions. We have placed a tremendous amount of gravel in the river thus far, and we've seen great results and um, have created or enhanced over 30 acres of spawning habitat and over a mile of side channel and uh, rearing alcove areas. So just a quick overview for many of you were able to come out to our Ansel Hoffman project that occurred uh, that was constructed in 2021. Um, one thing that all of our projects have in common is that they include a creation or enhancement of a spawning component, which are riffles that you hear me talk about. That's that clean, fluffy gravel that goes in the river that the fish need for spawning. Um, they also include a uh, creation or enhancement of a rearing habitat component, which might be side channel, it might be floodplain grading. We're also excited to include woody habitat material and riparian plantings, which are very important for, um, for providing cover and shade for the fish. And our sites use either offsite borrow or on-site, they may be self-feeding, which is very, um, very apparent here on this aerial photo of Ansel Hoffman. This was a self-feeding site where we're able to use the nearby gravel bar and excavate that material, place the right size gravel in the river for the fish to use to spawn in that excavated area becomes the, the rearing habitat component. And we do test fits every year to inform our approach for future project sites. And <clears throat> we aren't just building projects with no results. Um, the every When we build it, they do come. Uh, we can definitely say that. So, Two recent projects in 2019, we saw um, uh, almost zero reds in at the Upper Sailor Bar site in the 2018. In 2019, post enhancement, we saw over 1,600 reds on the two ripples that were placed. Uh, that new clean, fluffy gravel, really the fish responded very well to that. And last year at Ansel Hoffman, although we had very low flows in the river and it was hard to see, we knew the fish may have a hard time, but we were excited that they um, we're able to come in and use the site even at those low flows. Um, our Chinook uh, did use the site during the fall and our steelhead spawning was actually the best it's ever been at any site. 30% of the spawning steelhead on the river used um, Ansel Hoffman last year. So that's a real testament to the effectiveness of the, the uh, adaptive management and the work that we're doing each year. And as I mentioned, adaptive management and monitoring. Um, we conduct, uh, not only do we construct and plan habitat projects, but the Water Forum conducts a tremendous amount of biological and physical monitoring on the river. Um, we don't do all of this ourselves, as Jessica mentioned. We partner with other agencies for funding, and we leverage uh, work that others are doing in the river, and we have fantastic um, consultants that we work with. So part of that, uh, that monitoring that we do are looking at red surveys, which is where we're out counting and measuring areas where fish have spawned. We do snorkel surveys, which are actually fishery biologists snorkeling in the river and counting and documenting 
the condition and abundance of our juvenile fish. So they're able to see them and not, not touch them. We also do some interesting um, genetics and flow and life history work with our marker capture and otolith studies, which are actually the ear bone in the fish, which um, can be analyzed just like the tree rings on a tree. And we can tell a lot about where the fish lived and what it ate. And we do other interesting stuff like eDNA and water quality mon monitoring to document uh, you know, one-time conditions. We also conduct a tremendous amount of physical monitoring to understand how our projects are changing the river and how we can adapt our projects moving forward, including uh, topographic bathymetric surveys, LIDAR modeling updates. And we also uh, look at our sediment size and transport analysis to um, see how we need to adapt the projects moving forward and how they're reacting to various flow regimes. And we are working on a gravel maintenance plan um, in partnership funded by reclamation that we will be um, vetting through the regional parks. So where's the beef? Um, here we are, a closer look at 2022 plans at Sailor Bar and Nimbus Basin. Uh, as we are excited to have two projects this year, and this will be the longest time period that we've worked in the rivers so far under our program. But um, expect crews in the area from August 1st to uh, toward the end of the first week in October. But the active construction will only be about eight weeks. Uh, crews can be on site six to six but there won't be any noise uh, until 7 a.m. to be a good neighbor. And in-river work occurs only on weekdays. We are not in the river on the weekends so that we can be a good neighbor to our recreational users. Uh, the river is very busy on weekends and on holidays when we also do not do in-river work. And when wherever we're out on the parkway, we always take care of good neighbor improvements um, like a tree removal or trail, um, trail improvements um, at the request of parks. We like to be a good neighbor. And as Jessica mentioned, uh, Nimbus Basin is a site that we worked at in 2014. And Lower Sailor Bar is uh, actually an amalgamation of several sites that we've worked at um, over 10 years ago. And these sites are far upriver. So they are in need of a touch up because they are heavily used by the fish because the fish come as far upstream as they can and, and utilize those areas more heavily than, than areas farther downstream. And these areas are also heavily affected when, um, when we have higher flows in the river. So a few details on Lower Sailor Bar. We will be sorting gravel on site for this. Um, so we will, um, crews will enter the site either via Illinois Avenue or Olive Avenue. Any equipment that is brought in or hauling that occurs, it would be via Illinois Avenue. Olive Avenue um, through the neighborhood would not be used except for folks arriving or leaving work. So no heavy equipment, no hauling through that, that direction out of the site. Equipment will be brought onto the site at the beginning of the project and staged in our parking and staging area where the gravel will, that we excavate will be sorted. There's a tremendous amount of gravel and cobble available here at the, this borrow site. The right size gravel will be placed into the river and these three riffles that you see here marked for enhancing spawning habitat. And each of those riffles you'll notice has a boat notch uh, demarcated. And those were designed into the project at the request of um, our recreational boating community and regional parks in the past to ensure passage even at low flows. Um, there, we also will be placing um, over 80 woody habitat structures that have been repurposed um, from downstream core bank protection and bank protection mitigation projects. We're really happy to reuse those materials in the river and give them a second life as habitat. And those will go into our side channel, which will be excavated. And it's about 2,500 feet long on the south side of the river. We will be conducting some seeding once we're finished. And um, we hope to get volunteers involved as we did last year on our willow planting, which will occur next winter in the side channel excavated area. And any area along here, except for the area marked off with fencing, will be in general open during construction, except for small portions of the site where there might be an active excavation or it would be dangerous for the public to enter. So otherwise you'll be able to get around, you'll be able to use the bike trail and other walking trails and the roads. And our downstream riffle at this site addresses a, a known juvenile stranding area. So we're excited to be able to um, have the funding and support available this year to not only do some our habitat enhancement, but help address a known stranding issue when flows are low in the river. 
So not to get too far in the details on this, but this is just uh, a, a screenshot of one of our construction drawings. This is the middle riffle that you just saw on the other map. And what looks like a bunch of rocks in the river is really designed to specific salmon specifications. The way that this work is, the gravel is designed and graded once it's in the river, helps support the, the depth of water that we need to have over, red, over our reds um, once they are in place and have eggs incubating. And they also, this design supports having water flowing through the riffle, which is also important when the eggs are incubating in the gravel, they need to have fresh, clean, oxygenated water coming flowing past them. And they also need that water taking away their um, you know, waste metabolic products. And you can see here the, um, the boat notch that has been designed in. And here are just a few photos of what to expect when we are constructing the spawning habitat. It can be disconcerting to see equipment in the river, but the way that we do this is that um, we use river friendly equipment. So it actually is pressure washed, washed daily and it includes um, vegetable oil instead of uh, our normal hydraulic fluids. So it's no dirtier than a boat. And our first, uh, you know, several hundred loads of gravel create this berm that you see here, this outline around the project site. And that way you see the dirty water in the other photo. The, as the additional gravel is placed, that keeps that turbidity and that dirty water in that side, that berm for the most part. And the crews are able to get all, almost all the gravel out there placed and graded before we push all the way across the river. And this helps protect water quality and really keep that pulse of turbidity at the beginning of the end of the project. And <clears throat> this next drawing is just a quick overview of the rearing habitat enhancement that we will be implementing this year. This is the middle of the side channel. You see here a lot of small X's. Those are um, an approximation of the woody habitat that we're excited to place this year. The woody habitat is placed um, in order to, to help break up flows and provide places for our fish, our juvenile fish, once they've hatched out of their reds, to come over and find cover and hide from predators. Um, it can provide some shade and also a place for our uh, macroinvertebrates, so our water bugs, to, to live. And, um, and all those nooks and crannies and root wads and trees are very, very good for our juvenile fish. And there's been a tradition of removing wood from the river. So we're very excited to be able to include that as a habitat component in our projects moving forward. And this channel also does, um, we have uh, been out on site and the design includes some avoidance of a few large trees. You see some islands, some interesting spots in the channel and uh, the channel has more than one outlet. So if there is any a high flow event, there might be some siltation or just a, an odd change in flow. There's more than one way for for fish um, to get in and out of the channel. And here are just a couple of photos. The one with our crew and the, the logs you see is the construction of our rearing habitat woody, uh, woody components last year. Um, we won't be using boulders this year, but there's quite a bit of engineering and design calculations that go into including that information or that habitat component into our projects. And the way that we would be constructing our side channel this year is very similar to that berm concept I introduced. And it's shown on one of the other photos um, up on your right, where we do all of our work um, with an upstream and a downstream berm in place. So we, we do all of the, the mucky, messy work and get all of our excavation and wood placement complete. And then we open up the top and bottom of that side channel to help reduce the amount of turbidity um, and the duration of turbidity that might be in the water. And we're excited as once again, all they look very small in this photo to get volunteers out on our willow plantings because eventually with um, more growth and when there is uh, flows are in place for to support our rearing juveniles, then these willows eventually will be large enough, just like you see on other parts of the parkway to hang over the water. And they provide areas for um, our bugs to live. They provide shade. Um, cover and those bugs fall off in the water and become fish food for our juveniles. And um, Nimbus Basin is our other project that we're implementing this year. It's much smaller. The concepts are very similar, so I won't go over all of that again, except the only difference at Nimbus Basin is that our spawning gravel is going to not be borrowed from on site. It's going to come from Mississippi Bar, which is a few miles to the northeast. 
and it will come down Hazel Avenue. There is a small amount of gravel, only 4,200 cubic yards, so it won't involve any traffic impacts. And the bike trail will stay open during construction through this area, but the rest of the area will be uh, mostly closed off to pedestrians because it's just a very small area to work in, and we want to ensure that everyone stays safe. And um, in the Nimbus Basin area, we have been in close coordination with state parks as the managers of the nearby state recreation area and Sac State Aquatic Center to ensure that we aren't affecting their operations and that they're aware of the project schedule and, um, and what to expect. Great, and <clears throat> I can answer any questions that, that anyone has over the, the large list of agency reviews and approvals, but um, know that these projects are heavily vetted and analyzed by multiple state, federal, and local agencies to ensure that we aren't having detrimental effects to water quality, public safety, flood impacts, um, cultural resources, biological resources. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions about any of these consultations. We do follow a work window uh, that is demarcated by the Endangered Species Act. We can only work in the river from the beginning of July to the end of October. Um, within that work window, we try to not be in the river in October uh, much if we can avoid it because we do have our, our um, adult Chinook coming in. There is no spawning in general. The spawning is only starting to ramp up at that time. Um, most of the Chinook spawning occurs. Uh, peak spawning is in November, so we are well out of the river. And it's always very exciting because of the timing of our work. Um, we always see fish coming up and they start using the site almost as soon as we are finished. And for those of you who are Parkway users, uh, we have gone through our uh, vetting process with Parks Senior Leadership staff, also the RPAC, the American River um, Parkway Advisory Committee, and the Parks and Rec Commission, um, and they have approved the work that is to occur at Lower Sailor Bar. Um, Nimbus Basin is actually outside of the purview of the um, Parkway staff. But um, we did show that our our work is consistent with the Parkway Plan and the Natural Resource Management Plan as far as land management and activities that could occur. And last but not least, <clears throat> we mentioned some of the, the analysis and information and modeling that, that goes along with a lot of the permits that we have to, to acquire in order to do this work. But we also hear that um, in addition to that flood impact and sediment transport analysis that we do to look at public safety and flood impacts and make sure that we aren't having any effects on the parkway that are um, that are that would be detrimental. We do also conduct additional analyses at our more moderate flows that are not flood flows, um, lower and moderate flood flows to ensure that we are not going to have, um, you know, detrimental effects on erosion, cause maintenance issues for regional parks, um, we try uh, to show how we're not affecting the voter experience and also address any public safety concerns. And any of those uh, additional analyses, um, I'm happy to share with you at a later date. And back to Jessica. All right. Thank you, Erica. There's so much information in there, and I'm excited because <laughs> there's some questions that are starting to come in, and they're all really good questions. So thank you for that overview. Um, if you can't tell, we're really excited about these projects and, and all the happy to do all the work that goes into it and excited to, to talk more about them. So let Absolutely. me just talk for a second about what to expect if you live near the project. Um, and so some of these details. So what to expect. Um, the crews start uh, uh, at 6 a.m., but um, noise will not start until 7 a.m. and it goes until 6 p.m. Um, there will be some amount of employee traffic at the start and at the end of the day going into the site. Um, and again, but it'll be, you know, sort of minimal amount of employee traffic overall. The equipment traffic, um, that's the bigger, noisier machines. You can see there in that picture, that's a picture of the rock sorting plant um, and a bulldozer behind it. There is uh, equipment traffic at the start and at the end of the project. And, um, you know, there will be about 10 days of hauling gravel up to, to Nimbus. Uh, in terms of river access, I don't know about all of you, but I spent a lot of time out on the river playing and being on trails. Um, there will be portions that are blocked uh, in terms of river access during the act of construction, um, but they will be open during non-work hours. 
Um, there will be, it, it should be very clear to you sort of where the public is allowed and where they're not allowed. Um, and this is again, all for safety and to protect uh, the crews and the public during construction. There will be temporary fencing uh, and signage to direct uh, to direct all of us to direct the public uh, during during active construction periods. Um, so, and if you're a rafter, you might be asking, can I use these places? Um, there is no in-river work on the weekends, um, but we will have, and we will have in-river sort of traffic control, making sure that uh, that there's, you know, it's safe for you to to pass by. Um, so those are just some basics in terms of what to expect. Um, and there's some really good questions in uh, the Q&A. So let me just, I've got one or two more slides. We're here obviously to answer your questions and um, we do a tremendous amount of coordination and outreach throughout the process. So um, Erica talked a little bit about just the technical analysis that goes into this work and the review from folks like the Regional Parks Agency and their uh, River Task Force. Um, but you, uh, if you're in the project area, you might have received a mailer uh, that's up in the corner there. Um, and if not, and you're interested, we're happy to send you one. Uh, there's direct mail that was sent to about 2,600 neighbors. Um, there's a project FAQ and more information that's on our website. Of course, this session will be recorded. Uh, and then every year we do um, sort of open houses like this one, this virtual one, and then also offer some, you know, in-person uh, tour options if you're interested. So go ahead and reach out to us for that. We will have signage up around the site in four languages. Uh, and then also you should be hearing about the projects in the media, uh, whether that's social media, online, or there will be some news and print articles. Um, we are also in direct contact with the, the businesses that uh, rely on the river, uh, rafting companies, and uh, speak a lot with the, the fishing community. So please let us know that you, if you have any additional um, questions or need for outreach, uh, we're here for you and here to answer questions. Okay, next slide. All right, there you go. That's Erica's contact information, contact at waterforum.org, or you can call us. Um, and I see that there's some really good questions in the Q&A section. So uh, let me get into those. Um, if you're wondering where that is, thanks for coming back, Erica. If you're wondering where that is, that little Q&A button on the bottom, you can go ahead and type in a question. Um, I'm going to read through them. We've got about five questions right now. Um, and then uh, you can add some more, more, you know, as we go. So, all right, let's see. Paul C.C., I hope I'm saying your name, a board member from Alameda County Water District, thanks for joining us, uh, has a good question. Are there fish ladders to get above Nimbus Dam or will they be built in the future? Excellent question. Erica, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, no, that is a good question. And at this time, there is no fish passage at uh, Nimbus Dam. Yep. And, and th that I know of, there's no plan to build um, by reclamation or CDFW to, to include fish passage in any future um, repairs or, or changes at Nimbus or at Folsom. Mm -hmm. But there is a new um, fish ladder. Fish at there is. Yeah. yeah, maybe we can talk yeah, about that for a second because it's really cool. Maybe you can. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, although that we don't have, um, there is no fish passage past Nimbus Dam. There is a new fish ladder that was um, actually tested this fall that um, I believe reclamation funded and CDFW implemented. It, go, it provides a much longer path, more natural path up to the hatchery for those fish that are coming back up. They get all the way up the stream and then they go up the ladder into the hatchery where they are, um, where, where that is the end. But the past fish ladder was uh, required the CDFW staff to be in the river. Sometimes during high flows, it wasn't always safe. There's a concrete weir and pickets had to be put in the weir to help raise the water level and inundate the bottom of the old fish ladder. So it was, you know, staff uh, intensive, wasn't always safe. And um, this new ladder works at the, the normal flows and doesn't require any additional um, staffing or changes to river or water levels for it to work. And uh, for those of you who haven't been in the hatchery, I believe there are, um, I'm not sure if they're open right now with COVID restrictions going, with us going in and out of COVID restrictions, but you can see actually the entire new fish ladder. You can view it 
if you go down to Nimbus Basin, you can walk up the whole thing. It's it's covered in you know fencing and it's safe. And you can check that out uh, when the fish are running. I encourage you to check that out. And there's also a, uh, I believe there's a live webcam that's on during certain times of the day and a viewing window at the hatchery. That's awesome. I have not seen the live webcam, but I have been there when the fish are jumping the ladder and it is very, very exciting. Um, uh, that leads to another question about flows. And there's, so there's a few questions about this and about flows. Do we know what the flows will be during the work? And are we worried at all about the flows in the river during July and August? Are they going to be too high? Are we going to be able to do the work? Um, you know, wh what are what are we looking at in terms of flows and construction? The flows that we expect to see during our construction period are um, uh, we rely on forecasts from the Bureau of Reclamation for those flows. And our Lower Sailor Bar project will begin August 1st with our Nimbus Basin project beginning around September 1st. And right now we are hearing that we will have flows around 4,100 CFS in August and around 1,800 CFS in September. And those flows will, will ramp down to around 1,000 CFS uh, October through February. So those are <clears throat> what we expect to see over the year. And nothing like what you saw last year, which if you were on the river last year, flows were about 550. So very, very low flows. Mm -hmm. So the, those flows that you would have seen last year are as low as the river can get and still have our city of Sacramento and other water intakes working. Mm -hmm. Did that catch all of it, Jessica? I think so. Yeah. And um, <laughs> okay. we, we work very closely on you know weekly basis with the Bureau of Reclamation and participate in stakeholder groups where there's lots of conversations about flows. Um, and not only is reclamation a funder of this work, but they're also very well aware and engaged in the construction. So uh, we're working with them closely to make sure that uh, flows are safe for the crews and safe for the construction period and still meeting all their operational requirements. Okay, good question on EIRs, environmental impact reports. Do we have an EIR? And yes, we do. But Eric, if you want to describe more about what's in that EIR and where people can find it. Sure. Um, a link to our all of the environmental documentation for this, the, the Habitat program is available on our website. And um, we don't have an EIR for this project, We but we do have a CEQA document. It was an initial study mitigated negative declaration. Uh, the city of Sacramento and the Water Forum, we were the lead agency for the CEQA document, and that was prepared in co uh, coordination with Reclamation, who were, they were the NEPA lead on the environmental assessment. And um, uh, that is available on our website. That was prepared in 2019, and it covers projects effects through 2034. And there are a few addenda, if you um, are curious, to the CEQA document that have, um, you know, dealt with minor project updates over the years. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. Um, Let's see, there's a few other questions here. Let me ask one about, ooh, this is an exciting one. Okay, this is a good one, about woody material. So there's a question here about, um, in the past, the Army Corps of Engineers or SAFCA has had, uh, it's been difficult to get woody material back into the river or sort of plantings of willows. Um, has that changed? It sounds like there's some woody material and uh, that's going into the rearing sites. That has changed. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, there's been, especially on this river, with the heavy recreational use over time, wood gets removed from the river um, by maintenance and also it just washes down. Um, but we, through a recent process, going through a lot of additional analysis through our programmatic permitting and a lot of con uh, coordination with the core and the Central Valley Flood Protection Board, to give them more information and educate them on the types of projects that we're doing, which are very different than a lot of what they're dealing with. So we provided a tremendous amount of additional analysis and showed how we could include wood, uh, the large woody material and also plantings in our designs, not in the main channel, only over in side channel or rearing alcove areas where they're outside of the main channel flow and they're not where folks are recreating. So they're not in areas where people are floating down with rafts, they're over on the side. Um, by showing that we could include that material without causing any flood impacts and it actually is designed in. It's not what we call field fit. So all of the 
force balance and all the calculations that go along with including woody material and making sure that it won't float away during a flood flow um, really um, got us where we needed to go with being able to include that like just absolutely critical habitat component in the projects moving forward or starting last year and moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's nice to be able to be creating some of this rearing habitat. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and the wood, fun fact, the wood for <laughs> some of the projects this year is coming from within the Lower American River um, and is going to be reused from the Army of Corps of Engineers projects that are happening on the lower portion of the river. Uh, and we were able to coordinate with them and move that material back up and into the system. So that's always nice to, to be able to use that. All right, um, let's see, other questions. Um, just about, let's see, so just a specific question. Um, I live on the Rancho Cordova side of the river. How are these projects going to impact me? So what to expect? If you live on the Rancho Cordova side of the river, the the biggest project effect you're likely to experience is a beep, beep noise, <laughs> <laughs> which is the backup, um, the backup beeping alarm on all the equipment, all the heavy equipment in the river. So you'll likely hear some noise when equipment is working in the river and the side channel, the excavation of the side channel is on the Rancho Cordova side. Um, however, it's a ways away from the bike trail, so the bike trail is going to remain open, so you're likely only to experience some noise and temporary uh, difficulty of access along the alignment of the side channel, because we, we don't want um, anyone, you know, walking into an area that's been excavated. Excellent. And I'm imagining the same thing if you live on the Fair Oak side as well. Absolutely. Little, the Fair Oak side is... Noise, yeah. Yeah, a little bit of construction noise and um, some some noise that, you know, a lot of activity the first day or two when we bring in all the equipment on the semi trucks and unload it. And uh, a day slightly about halfway through the project when the um, crew working on the Nimbus Basin project comes over to pick up their woody material and move it over to that site. Mm -hmm. But very, very minor. Other than noise. Excellent. All right, well, I think that's all we have in terms of questions. Um, so thank you all so much for attending this evening. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us uh, with that contact information. Um, or for those of you who, you know, who you, you know how to find us, for those of you who are regulars at the Water Forum. Um, also, there is a lot of information on our website, uh, including fact sheets and some really cool videos from pat projects in the past. So I would encourage you to go check those out. Um, and other than that, we're going to keep you posted on updates for um, the Water Forum website. And that's it. Thank you all so much for attending and have a great evening. Thank you. And thank